77 to 79, you'll notice that Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, made a mention of this, the coming one who was to bring peace, and he himself the great one of peace. And he says here, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. And uh, you'll notice that the knowledge of salvation can come only one way that is to have the experience of your sin committed. And through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness <coughs> and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And this is something, of course, <coughs> that is very, very wonderful because we know peace left the earth when Eve left the word and Adam followed her. And from that time, there has been no peace in the world, and there is no peace in the hearts of men as there ought to be and will not be until that great day we're looking forward to. So unrest gripped all creation, and the violence of sin will soon bring the wrath of God upon the earth in the direct way that was brought in the uh, first chapter of Romans, which we read many, many times. <clears throat> now notice the message of peace in this hour that Brother Branham brought to us in the exposition of the church ages when he preached them to us. And in Revelation 1 and 4, it said, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, 
and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. <clears throat> now, since he can't change, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, what he was introduced as at that particular time, he is still the same in the hour of this visitation, which you will notice that Brother Branham brought to our attention in verses 12 to 18, which we perhaps do not need to read all of them. I turned to see the voice that spake with me, being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Midst the seven candles, it's candlesticks, one like the son of man, clothed with the garment down to the foot, <clears throat> and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes a flame of fire, his feet like undefined brass, if they burned in the furnace, his voice is the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars. Not his mouth, but a sharp two-edged sword, and he counts as the sun that shineth in strength, and so on. And Brother Branham said that was the judge. <clears throat> so you'll notice that the judge is bringing peace. Now, usually a judge is not one who brings peace. He is simply one who interprets the law and then demands that the law be executed according to his interpretation, whether it is right or not. <clears throat> so... At the end time period, <clears throat> which started in the, under the seals, Revelation 6, 1 to 8, let's look at that a second. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as were the noise of thunder, one of the fourth beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, behold, a white horse, and he that sat in him was given a bow, and a crown given, and he went forth car to conquer. <laughs> Open the second seal, I heard a beast say, Come and see, not the one came another horse red. And power was given him to sat thereon to take peace from the earth, <clears throat> that they should kill one another. He was given him a great sword. And the third beast was a black horse, and the man had a pair of balances in his hand, and he was selling the means of salvation. And then the last beast was a pale horse or a brindle horse, <clears throat> and uh, him that sat upon him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him to kill, to take the last vestige of peace from the earth where men would not be able to decide for themselves or live in any type of peace with God whatsoever it would be a very terrible, terrible condition. <clears throat> now in this age, in the third chapter, you'll notice that the message of this age by the messenger is anything but a message of peace, though the God of peace is on the scene. He said, because you need a because you're lukewarm and either cold or hot. I speak out of my mouth because you see I'm rich and preach goods and eat nothing and know it's not your wretched, miserable, poor, naked, and blind. <clears throat> and absolutely away from God. Now, that's the condition of the world which started at the Garden of Eden. And you'll notice it's gotten progressively worse until God is going to destroy everybody and everything at the end of this age, <clears throat> preparatory for the millennium. <clears throat> and then at the end of the millennium, when the earth and we go through a further sanctifying process, the earth especially, then everything is dissolved so that God can give us the perfect peace that we are entitled to through his attributes <clears throat> and those attributes on display in his reign. So Brother Brown is speaking of this great pyramidal city which is 1,500 miles at the base and 1,500 miles high, made of pure transparent gold, and which is the Lamb of God on the throne, and God above there, the Logos above him. And the waters of light pouring from under the throne, everything a vista of beauty, everything a paradise, the tree of life giving 12 manner of fruits, and also no doubt other trees giving their fruit and the kings, to memorialize the peace that God brought. <clears throat> because that's what man's interested in, getting back to the place of peace. I don't think that people actually are as concerned about good clothes and good food and uh, maybe some degrees of safety as they're really concerned about peace. To be really peace, have peace within. <clears throat> and uh, that great city of peace under the giver of peace is the home of the bride. Now, Brother Bram 
time of speaking, at the end of the thousand years, <clears throat> the earth will be then ready for this complete restoration and renovation. So in 286, he says, so old man and old woman, don't you be discouraged. That time he was only 56 and he called himself an old man. He realized he'd be 79 years old <clears throat> last April. I know that for good reason, because he's five years older than that. Don't be discouraged. If you are represented up here, and he pointed to the <clears throat> top of the uh, Zion, New Jerusalem. If you're represented up here in this attribute of God, he's God, you know. If you're represented here, you're in the eternal. <laughs> now, you got to know that before even the millennium. Mm -hmm. Some have known it, like Abraham, for a long time. And you don't need a personal visitation from God either to confirm it. You just have to be the word for the hour. If you're represented here, you're in the eternal. <clears throat> and if you cross from that seventh day, that's millennium, into the eighth day, and you got into the eternal by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> you're included in this. Now, there isn't anybody on this God made special effort. There isn't anybody living, prophet or anybody, Whoever used the perfect choice words, so you'd be hearing the same thing every time, and the way you should hear it, so that you wouldn't feel <clears throat> there's a bit of a contradiction. Now, there's never any contradiction, but it's strange, the language. Now, I said, if you're represented up here, you would have to be there as the Son of God with the life of God. And then he says, how do you get into the eternal? We already were in it. Well, the thing is, then how do you get back? Is what he's really saying. By the baptism with the Holy Ghost. In other words, you get back into the body that God had prepared, prepared to glorify himself, which is the bride of Christ, which is completely represented in God having taken from the dust of the earth and glorified it and lived in it, and now doing the same with us. So what you're looking at, <clears throat> nobody can ever say exactly. Only God can. And his exactly is worse than almost anybody else's because he needs to come on the scene and tell us what he's saying. But I want you to notice these words here <clears throat> that they're not contradictory. And much of what Brother Branham says is merely the point of view to bring to your attention what he wants you to get. And he's wanting you to know here that this great city is what really God prepared and had known in his mind before the beginning of time and it was all for himself. Then he began spreading himself up, bringing a family. <clears throat> so he said, now it's for me and my family. And I'm going to live there with them. <coughs> so always you're looking at the sovereignty of God because he pointed to your representation and where you were represented. Now, I am not represented here. I am here. So you see, what you're looking at then is not something <clears throat> that is... Uh, un what you're looking at when Brother Brown said represented, you're looking at an imputation in the sense that you're just as good as in the great city because you already were in him. <clears throat> we're looking at sovereignty. So don't, don't ever think of anything in this message outside of sovereignty. So I wanted to draw that to your attention. And you get into the knowledge that you were represented 
by being baptized with the Holy Ghost. So you know that you were in that, which he points his finger to, Mount Zion, and you're included in it. Now, if you're just trusting upon a sensation, or jumping up and down, or saying, I do this, I keep my seventh day, that's seventh day Adventism, <clears throat> and I'm strong in those people, I don't eat meat, and things like that, that's going to perish in the end. But this is eternal. Now remember, eternal never had a beginning. Amen. But eternal can take shape and form, which it didn't have in the beginning, in the sense of where it was, which was in God. Amen. This is the eternal. The feast after the feast of the tabernacle. Now, <clears throat> the feast of the tabernacles is where they cut down boughs. It was the last feast in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, and I don't want to read it, but you can go over that yourself. They had the Passover, the first fruits, Pentecost, and all. <clears throat> the last was the cutting down of boughs where they lived in what was called tabernacles, but weren't. They were little sheds or little arbors. They were made up of cut down branches, <clears throat> signifying the non-permanency of it. <clears throat> and you'll notice that Brother Branham placed the seventh church age in the Feast of the Tabernacles, which showed you that no matter what you went through, of all the feasts, and there were six, the number of men, when you came to the seventh, it didn't do you any good in the sense of permanency. <clears throat> permanency had to have its own peculiar setting and principles which demanded a permanency of every single attribute that was in God and for man and some base in man. Understand what I'm saying? So that's why the millennium, the seventh day, has to end up with the seventh feast, <clears throat> the same as the seventh age, has to end up with the seventh feast, which we have come this far, but it's still not permanent. You get to the millennium. It's not permanent. <clears throat> so, between the time of God's introspection and the formulation of his sovereign preordained desires and plans to the consummation of it, there is an impermanency in all of his people. It was in the Garden of Eden all the way through. But now coming back through the resurrection <clears throat> and to the new creation, there is a permanency. This is it. Now, I hope you know what I'm driving at, but I'm trying to show you the principle of God and sovereignty, <clears throat> what God had, what God wants for us, what God is going to give us. The Feast of the Tabernacles was the last feast, the seventh feast. We're worshiping now under the Feast of Tabernacles, <clears throat> the seventh church age, and it is the least permanent of all. It's a horrible mess that's got to be burned up, see? So, we are to get ready, <clears throat> and <clears throat> we are to try to receive the stimulation of revelation that we are possessors of the kingdom of peace and a peace that no other age has really known. We are going to miss the great tribulation. <clears throat> We're going to hear about that as you go along. Now, in the millennium, 287, we'll be under the Feast of Tabernacles again in its seventh day. Now, seventh age seventh feast, seventh day, millennium, right? Mm -hmm. 6,000 years, come to seven, the same feast. <clears throat> Showing you are in a place of immediacy, transition, and you 
better not want too many things in this world because how fast and how far can you travel when you're encumbered? Now, God only let Israel move from one land to the other, taking their possessions. Now, Dave had a great experience here a few years ago. He went up here somewhere around Cadillac, took all his furniture and everything up, put it in the house, and the house burned down. Didn't bring anything back, did he? Burned down flat. Feast of the tabernacles, huh? <clears throat> Anybody could have that experience. Everything's going to go. The only thing that isn't going to go is the grace of God invested through redemption in his sons. So <clears throat> what you're supposed to be looking at now in the stimulation of revelation is the permanency, the stability, the imminency that is ours through the coming kingdom. And 1,000 years is but a day. We're looking the same as you look at the great white throne. <clears throat> now, we're waiting for seven days, another feast. But then after the seventh day, we have a holy convocation. <clears throat> Everybody now gets together. We go back into the eternal. So we were in there. We got out of it by means that God implicated we were separated from the knowledge and grace of him. And now by the rebirth, put back into the position <clears throat> which our flesh led us astray, when our flesh led us astray. <clears throat> and now we are hand in hand with God in his hour. Now, go back, we go back into the eternal. How? By the eternal one, that came and redeemed us. Now the eternal one is God alone because there's no beginning and no end. It's like Melchizedek. <clears throat> and took us back, letting us recognize that we are a part of him. Now, let's just look at that for a minute here. He said we're a part of the great eternal one and God has taken us back. <clears throat> well now, uh, of course he means there that he's taken us back to himself. The lost children, like the prodigal sons, are all back to God. Also, it means we're back to Adam. <clears throat> all the way back to Adam and not Eve. Mm -hmm. We're not back to Eve. Adam was supposed to be the father of all. Eve messed him up on that, so he wasn't. And she became the mother of all. <clears throat> but Adam still fathered, and he was, in a limited sense, the father of Eve. Mm -hmm. Now, we got serpent seed in there, which we'll talk about later on. <clears throat> so he got us all the way back to where we are now and will be shortly free from anything that the serpent and his power had to do with us. Now, notice that Brother Branham said he's taken us back. How do we know? From Matthew 12. <clears throat> Doing again the same works in the form of the Holy Spirit he did when he was here in the flesh for Israel. But Israel could not recognize him. And it's sad to say that many people do not recognize his presence today. 288. Now how do you know you're a part? Because that's the word of the hour, the promise of the day. Now, he said, how do you know you're a part? <clears throat> because that is the word of the hour, the promise of the day, that you will know that you are a part. Well, <clears throat> Taking us back, he said, what is it? A restoration back to the first day, the very first. He'll restore the hearts of the children back to the fathers. <clears throat> now, Brother Branham is answering the question for us here. How do we really know that we are a part of God by virtue of having been a part of God? And this answers the question what he's telling us. And that is, do we believe that his message and what's before us is the vindicated truth that restores and brings us back full circle to the faith in our own faith. <clears throat> back to the same true faith that is repudiated 
And now the church is repudiated. Now, <clears throat> Brother Brana spoke of getting back to the faith that the fathers had. Now, I want to just bring something to your attention. There is no definition in any dictionary <clears throat> that I can put my hand on, that I've looked at, that defines faith <clears throat> as built upon and observed knowledge. Faith presupposes <clears throat> a statement that is made. And without proof, you literally take that statement to be correct. Because faith does not deal with what is seen it deals with what is unseen. But you know something? Though that is true. <clears throat> How wise would I be to simply accept something on the say-so of any man? How wise would I be <clears throat> to accept the Bible as the Word of God when no book has ever proved itself? So if we're going to get back all the way to faith, <clears throat> where you and I just take the word, and that's it, <clears throat> you're going to have to have some truth, some evidence somewhere, that the words of that book prove themselves. In other words, it's got to be a living book. <clears throat> now, Hebrews 11. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. It's the giving of substance. It's not a substance. It's a substanting. Give substance to it. <clears throat> Something you stand upon. Of the things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. To faith to understand the worlds are framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. And right on down the line, you're going to find that every single one of those people positively had a confrontation with God and His Word, and it proved highly successful. Amen. <clears throat> now, that's what you call the vindication theorem. And we had it from Matthew 12. We don't need one more bit of evidence. And that means no sensations, no jumping up and down, no trying to go into it. Well, the trying is a good thing if you do it right. But as I said concerning a legalist, the legalist is the guy that tries to make everything go. A man of grace, he knows there's just one thing to go, and that's for him to get out of the way and let God go ahead. And if man ever learned that, he's in the driver's seat right there, God himself. And he'll drive like Jehu and raise a cloud of dust every single time. He'll drive his enemies crazy by loving them. He'll drive those pe the, the people that hate him by just doing nice things. He'll kill all the sour pusses by smiling all day long. Because he gets out of the way. I can visualize the three Hebrew children before they got thrown in the fiery furnace. <clears throat> Daniel wasn't there. He got thrown in the lion's den. But how could they possibly stand before a king and say, okay, I'm sorry. I know you don't like your seat go this way, and I don't either. But this way it's going to go because I'm not bending. What did those people have? They had something vindicated. God has not asked either you or me to take any statement that is not vindicated in this hour. Because when he was here in the flesh, he said, tell me. What I haven't done that needs to be done. Show me one place I failed. What do you want anyway? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and like a bunch of idiots, they took the bait. You got the same people in the Church of Christ who said to Brother Branham, when he said the little girl's been healed, give me the money. Well, we thought that we would cut the little girl and you would pray and she'd be here. He said, You are your father the devil. Amen. I'll ask you questions. 
the light of what we teach here based on Brother Bran, the light of the great white throne, where are those pe those men going to go? Mm -hmm. Where is the Church of Christ going to end up in? Now, I know you want to be tender hearted and sweet. Firstly, I'm not on your side. I'm not interested in being tender hearted and sweet. Not over this one, as indicated. Because if I go your way, if you shouldn't be going that way, I will condemn my soul by tomorrow morning. Forget it. I got enough trouble now with Lee Baal and his problems of faith without taking side with anybody that blasphemes the holy name of God and tempts the Lord God. Amen. I may sound tough, but I'm sorry for it. If you're sweet and kind and I'm not, I'm sorry for it. I'll take my chances where I am. <clears throat> See? Now listen, you cannot you cannot be a witness to something false. Paul said, if God raised not up Jesus, we have become a false witness. Now this is not true. If he did not have thus said the Lord, if what he is saying here is not based upon the vindication theorem. Your faith and my faith is strictly stupid mm -hmm. and for the birds. Right. Amen. Because there are men ten times smarter than where you from. Twenty times more educated. Many times more brilliant. But nobody had what he had. <laughs> I don't care what he says, anybody says didn't have it. <clears throat> they might try to imitate him and think they got something. When that man told us <clears throat> what he told us, the hearts of the children would be restored to the faith of the fathers based upon Matthew 24, 27, where the light coming out of these shines to the west <clears throat> and told us what it was. That settles once and for all what the prophet came to do. It settles once and for all the Son of Man and the ministry of the Son of Man. It settles once and for all who's bride and who isn't bride. They are separated now because the peaceful, loving judge said it. Well, there's your stimulation revelation. God made it kind of legal. We say, years ago, I'm going to let my Miss Street cut her ugly people. Oh, now you weren't much of Pentecost. You're a man today. <laughs> but you saw a bit of it. <clears throat> The old emotional drag. Look at how high you jump, how fast you tear around, how much you scream, how you get exhausted even, or how happy you get. What has that got to do with that? Mm -hmm. Now, that's fine if you want to tear, hoot and holler, jump and scream at him, if it's based on that. Amen. Like Brother Branham tore around that tree that time just screaming to God. You've all felt that way at times. I know you have, so I'm not I'm not taking that away from you. I'm just letting you know here, brother and sister, that this man is speaking based upon a vindicated ministry placing a bride in New Jerusalem. And I'm going to prove in a minute or 15 minutes from now when I use my own name here. <clears throat> Doesn't mean that I'm actually part of the sense I've got it made nobody else has. I'm just going to use my, he uses my name here. He restored the hearts of the children back to the Father. See, bringing a restoration, <clears throat> again, of the Pentecostal genuine, not sensation. The manifest evening light, Matthew 24, 27. The same sun that shows the morning light. That's a promise for the day. Now, if you believe that, if you can put together Matthew 12, <clears throat> Matthew 24, Luke 17, Malachi 4, well, if you're not bright, you're sure getting pretty close to one. Because mm -hmm. right. that's a promise of the hour, and that's what you believe. <clears throat> if you don't believe that, well, it's too bad. I don't know what you do believe, because what you got isn't vindicated. What you got is from some textbook. Isn't going to work. First two, two, two paragraph three. Now, where are we, friends? Where are we? Just waiting now to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. So Revelation 11, that's the two witnesses can come to the Jews and make their hour known to them 
vindicated as our hour was made known to us. That's right. The rapture is coming. Why? Because the Lord has descended the shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and any time the dead are going to rise. <clears throat> and we're going to be changed. <clears throat> be caught away in a rapture. All right. Watch. Outside the gates of the wall spread across the new earth, nations will dwell in eternal peace. There you are. Jesus said, I'm going to bring the sword upon the earth. Why did he bring a sword? To kill all the troublemakers. For they that take the sword perish by the sword. And those that take the sword of God, as hypocrites and unbelievers in the truth, they'll perish by the same sword. The same word that went out of his mouth, brothers and sisters, coming on this earth to destroy him, and the blood will run up to the horse's bridles like water. <clears throat> now watch. In this place of eternal peace, eternal, because the eternal king of peace is there. Now watch. Honored kings will bring their glory into it. No sin can be there. No more bobbed hair women in that city. I'll guarantee you that. What do you think of that one? Doesn't matter. <clears throat> Why would a vindicated prophet make a stupid statement like that? It's not stupid. Amen. You see, it shows what's in the woman's heart. That's all. Remember, you've got to watch women as the tight brother's sister. They're no worse than men. <clears throat> no better than men. Oh, I forgot to bring something. I'm going to read it to you how this woman is a great preacher and her husband comes along to help her. <laughs> bravo, bravissimo. Oh, God, the Pentecostals. No more wearing shorts, short waist, cigarette smoking, whoremongers, whores, liars, or dollars. Whoever they were won't enter that city. No, it'll all be over. Sin will be gone. Or the sinner be gone too. He's the guy that did it. Nothing to defile his holiness shall enter there. That's what he said. All has passed away forever. In other words, the perfect potential of redemption, which we possess now, gives way to the perfect manifestation of redemption. Everything that lay in the seed of redemption, wherein there would have to be attributes, all of those attributes are manifested. How? Physically. <clears throat> Physically. Look out in the fields and around its gates. That's outside the holy mountain. The bear will be gentle. There will be bears out there, same as the inside. Won't be tame. The lion shall lie down with the lamb. The beast of the, from the wild will be led by a child. I'll be changed from the creature I am. No, that's true and it's not true. You're just going to get some better dubs on. You're the same person. Who talked about that? I think, I don't know, maybe my notes aren't in that. <clears throat> maybe we'll get to it. Some thoughts just that are beautiful. In spite of this death working in my mortal body, an old age setting it all be changed. You heard the song? The bear will be gentle, the wolf be tame. He'll not jump up and rear up and try to kill you. He'll walk with you down the path. Who's going to inherit it? The redeemed. Who will it be? <clears throat> He's going to tell you who they are. Watch it now. Notice, I can only teach my types now. Notice, Brother Lee. Who comes out on the new earth with Noah the prophet? Those who went in with him into the ark. <clears throat> now, Noah wasn't God. Noah represented God. See? Each age has a messenger. <clears throat> the, last, the last age has a prophet. That's right. Those who walk out on it. See? Who are they? Those who went in with Noah by his message. Mm -hmm. Amen. See? They were the ones who walked out upon the new earth after its water baptism. Now, I'd like to have just anybody disprove that one. <clears throat> Why, they say, well, just a minute, Brother Bill. Have me his wife and his sons and their wives with family. That's exactly right. Who listened but his family? Amen. Mrs. Lot didn't listen to his family. And the two girls were wild. Man, they were wild. <clears throat> Look at the mess they brought in the world for their sin and folly. All right, who's going to walk out on this earth? The bride in every age? 
but he's talking to you and me to have faith in him. Brother Branham wanted above all else that people had faith in him. Why did he love Joseph, his son, as he loved Joseph as no other person? Perhaps. I can't answer the full question there, Chuck, but put it perhaps. Because he said Joseph believed him, and the others didn't. He talked about his death, how that his family wouldn't listen. He said, if you carry me one day in a pine box and Billy be there with a handkerchief in his eyes, <clears throat> be too late. See? He wanted the people to believe him. His veracity, based upon a genuine vindication. We know that Brother Branham was vindicated somehow by someone. We know the somehow only too well. If this Bible is correct, we have every right to believe who the someone was. Amen. Who did the somehow. <clears throat> and we do. It shouldn't be strange that God would appear that way. He appeared to Moses, Amen. Elijah, and others. When did he become Jesus Christ or Jehovah? the God of the Old Testament, who used to be but isn't anymore, or changes his ways to be capricious. God is anything but capricious. God is an old fuddy-duddy. He doesn't, he's not interested in change. That's right. I use the term respect, but he's a fuddy-duddy. Not interested in change. He doesn't want to be changed. He's going to be changed. I'm the Lord, I change not. I tell you, son, that Jacob smart off. If it weren't for that very thing, he says, you'd be consumed. You better be glad I'm a fuddy duddy. Mm -hmm. I don't change. My, that's good. Oh, my, I'm glad. Man, because we, I hate to think of the changes I go through, and it's not a good metamorphosis here. Thank God God doesn't change. He becomes. And what form he becomes, essentially, he is never one. What would you say? Billion, part, trillion? Well, never, no, didn't. <clears throat> no change. Now, those who took Noah's message walked out upon the new earth after his water baptism. <clears throat> Who's going to walk out after the fire comes that simply renovates? We will. Bride of seven church ages and the Old Testament, all the bride. <clears throat> Who are going to walk out upon the new earth Everyone that died in Adam became alive in Christ. All the foolish virgin, every single one was there. Now watch. Those, now, the one who goes in with Jesus now, that's the one who goes in now. How do you get into him? By one spirit. And he is the word. And you become a part of him. What part of him are you? The word that's living at this hour, recognizing him. In other words, there's something that's going to test your faith and test who you are. <clears throat> and it's right before you what the test is. Can I go along with this, or will I sit here like a hypocrite? And when the chips are down, I'll show my colors at the end. Now look, I'm talking about an experience. I'm talking about a man who said to a friend of Joe Ratzkowitz, claimed he believed this message all the way, he said Brother Branham wasn't the prophet. <clears throat> Died in the old Pentecostal trying to act as though he believed the message. I still say what Lloyd says, and I like it. You will never snow anybody that understands the presence. Amen. You can snow smart men on any subject, any type of work, but when it comes to this subject here, I've said it many times, it isn't a gift with me, it's just something, and it doesn't always happen. I wish it did. There wouldn't be one person that I wouldn't know what he's exactly like. But it just takes one word. <clears throat> and you can tell me that person is, what he's got or what he hasn't got. Now, if you're recognizing the word of your hour, understand that the prophet is the living word of God for this hour. He's that word manifested because God spoke of that one coming. And him doing those works whereby you can recognize him. If you recognize him, then positively you are one of those who will walk out onto the millennium. You'll be there. Vindicated there. <clears throat> His estate. See? All right. 
Now notice, not a new generation, <coughs> but transplanting. Now remember that when you go through the book of Matthew, it speaks of 14 generations. But I think it's Matthew, you don't come up with 42. There's one missing. The reason there's a missing is because Christ never had seed. And so now the Bible says he shall see his seed. So Brother Branham tells us <clears throat> that there's going to be a new generation. And those are the very words of the Bible that I pointed out to you before. This is not something I discovered on my own. It's something I read about, but the guy doesn't know what we know. Or he'd be happier than he was, but I'm glad I knew that he looked at this verse. In verse 30 of Psalm 22, this is a psalm, you know, Christ is foretelling his suffering through the prophet. Like Isaiah 53, a seed shall serve him. It should be counted to the Lord for a generation. <clears throat> Brother Branham says, notice that not a new generation, a transplanting of the seed. Now look, let's go back and talk about Abraham a second. <clears throat> How old would Abraham be if he were living today? A man alive, I really don't know. Let's take a see if we can find something here by uh, the old guy that uh, gave us her chronology. Can't remember his name. <clears throat> but <clears throat> they got him about, well, they got him way back here somewhere. But they put, they got it about 18, 1900. So you could say it was 2,000 years roughly and 2,000 years more. <clears throat> you got at least 4,000 years old. Now the point is this. Let's say Abraham is 4,000, which really doesn't mean anything. And you're sitting here tonight, and you're 60 years old. That ain't true. Abraham's not 4,000 years old, and you're 60 years old, and you're 20 years old. You're just old as Abraham. Amen. And Abraham's just as young as you. Amen. Because the seed was eternal. <laughs> it just depended when the seed got its form. That's how God becomes. That's why it's one generation. Just one across the board. They were all in God, and it's going to be proven. They're all going to come up, and I think it's wonderful. No, it's not a new generation or transplanting. That's great. I like that. It's your brother Brad. Notice, if God could raise up Elijah and take him up 2,500 years ago and transplant him back on earth again to be a prophet for the Jews, how much more can he do the bride? And he tells you right there, Elijah was taken away. They saw him upon Mount uh, Transfiguration, and then he's going to come back again. Right here on earth to the Jew. Well, if he can do that, <clears throat> certainly he can do this other. What he's doing is giving us simple faith in the resurrection by showing us a type. All right? 293. After Noah came out of the ark, notice what was said to Noah. After he came out of the flood, just like it was with Adam before. After he came upon the earth, God said, multiply and replenish the earth. After the flood. Notice what to be fruitful. Replenish the earth as Adam the first. Now you can see exactly here. Now listen real close. Adam was to multiply and replenish the earth. Is that right? Noah was after the new world, after the new, the world was destroyed, to multiply and replenish the earth. Get it? Now, can't you see what the serpent seed is? What replenish the earth? You get it? <clears throat> now, if this is kind of vague to you, it's simple as ABC. The question is, why does he bring this in about the serpent seed? Because each time the earth is to be replenished, see, every single time, the replenishment is destroyed. Well, why would God tell anybody to replenish the earth and turn around and destroy it? <clears throat> you say, well, it's a matter of sin. Hogwash. It's not true. It's not true at all. Because if God were to destroy anybody on the basis of sin, God is Father, he'd be destroying himself. So you see what he's trying to tell you. Every single time the command goes forth, it's not done by the right people. <clears throat> so you've got to destroy it. Now he said, how then could God destroy having told them? And listen, it doesn't matter how he told them to do it, they did it. 
It's the animals all skewed up and all messed up with eating. <clears throat> so they got a bunch on the earth. All right, I ask you a question. What about after the blood? They're in the position that God knows they're in. He's instituted a sacrifice. He's given his word. Now he said, go ahead, and you're to do it by sex. So they do it by sex. And how does God say it's destroy it? He's defeating his own purpose. If you can't see serpent seed, mm -hmm. that's what he's trying to show you. If you can't see serpent seed here, as plain as the nose on your face as you read the Bible, you're not reading. Or you're so spiritually gross, you're not interested. You follow what I'm trying to get across to you? God, how could God do it? Here the man multiplies, the woman multiplies. Then he says, I'm going to destroy it, multiply it. Your boss tells you to go and, <clears throat> and empty the four buckets of water. You do it. So he fires you. For doing what you're told, you've got to be free to do it. That's right. <clears throat> Let's get the picture. Abraham knew the truth of election. And he said, shall the judge of all the earth destroy the righteous with the wicked? And he knew he wouldn't do it. Amen. That's exactly why Paul preached his dissertation on the sovereignty of God. <clears throat> the election, the vessels, not of him that willeth or of him that doeth, but of God. So what if I live the most wonderful life in all the world? And I turn down the word. I'm exactly where Dr. Newell put it. <clears throat> he said, there are those that seek after God by works. And they remind me of the man who's trying to jump across the Atlantic Ocean from New York to Calais in France. And the tragic thing is the farther he jumps, the worse shape he's in because he's out deeper where nobody can rescue him. So therefore, the more you look at yourself and think you're going to be a good fellow, this and that and the other thing, the more you are self-deceived. Just get this picture flat. If you believe in sovereignty and you believe at all that you were in God, God would have to destroy a part of himself if you were in God in turn to destroy you. It just simply can't be done. Amen. It's asinine to think other words. Mm -hmm. It shows that people have literally lost their minds not to understand this. Don't look at me as though I've lost mine. I've got a very good mind. I'm not eating smart pills or anything else. I'm taking the word of God. See? Listen, all right. <clears throat> <clears throat> this is serpent seed. 2295. You see how Satan got to Eve now? That's why death has reigned on earth ever since. There you are. Heaven, earth, beast, atmosphere is all cursed of God because of it. That's the curse. Be Satan because Satan got to this first. <clears throat> That's exactly true. The Bible distinctly said that Cain was of that wicked one. Mm -hmm. Amen. And he slew his brother. Let's face it, it was his half-brother. It was not his brother. And you know who the original bastard was? Not what you people think. Not a child out of childbirth. It's a man marrying a woman that didn't belong in the election of Abraham. In the 12 tribe. And the seed was not dissolved until the 10th generation. You get a black man and a white woman get together, vice versa, and there's just too much what's going on. You see, did you see this week's U.S. News? Did you see People's Magazine? America over here fussing about Africa. Just take a look and you'll find out maybe they're a little bit smarter than we are. Let's take a black and a white get together. <coughs> you got a mulatto when they get together, right? Mm -hmm. And the second time you got a quadroon. Then you got to to provide you a white keep white keeps marrying. <clears throat> so take them out. That's half black, half white. All right, then another white marriage, you're going to have a quadroon. Then you get an octoroon, and you're back to where they're white. <clears throat> so we understand a few things from that simple illustration right there. <clears throat> now, where was he here? He said here, 
That's why death has reigned on earth ever since. In heaven, earth, beast, atmosphere is all cursed by God. That's the curse Satan got to this first. So Satan got <coughs> to be first through the beast. See? And that brought the half brother. The half brother, and you never get rid of the flesh. You can't do it, what's in there. Do whatever work, it keeps on going. <coughs> down, down, down to the extent that you have a complete mixture and now God has by election to pick these all up. <clears throat> now, Jesus came to redeem it back to the Father. In order to do this, he became, now watch, in order to do this, he became a part of it. Right there, you're going back again to the earth <clears throat> because he takes on a part of the earth. Mm -hmm. Watch it. And from that very dust, the part Jesus was himself, being redeemed through him. All of the attributes of children of God <coughs> are redeemed with the earth. Now, that's something that we must understand is very, very important. Now, never at any time has any man with the depth of understanding and the spirituality as contained in Brother Branham, apart even from the fact that he was a divinely inspired prophet, <coughs> ever put the emphasis on the redemption of the earth and why New Jerusalem and what we're going to have and how we identify today as this man did it. You can't find it. <coughs> it was all just a pie in the sky. Some nice little thing God was doing. Let me tell you, this is what God set out to do. At the same time, at the same time, and bringing forth us as children. Mm -hmm. And people wonder why the Bible says he's going to destroy those that destroy the earth. <clears throat> and you wonder why people today are rising up. They're trying to go back to a yesteryear and they can't do it. They're trying to keep birds and animals from being destroyed and they can't do it. They're trying everything to put nature back in a harmony and it cannot be done anymore then you can put Cain back in the loins of the serpent. It's all over. It's gotten worse and worse and worse. <clears throat> Our brother Branham wants us to see this. That's why he called himself a conservationist. Indeed he was. Here again is the perfect plan of God. And we are that perfect plan of God in our perfect setting. And that perfect plan of God is just as much a part of God's redemptive plan, though not in that great order as we are. So God's going to bring us all back. Yep, all back. <clears throat> Absolutely. Rose without thorns. Now they tell me the apple and the thorn and the and the rose rose are, are related. Maybe in the future we'll have beautiful roses and great big apples where the roses were. I love rose apples. You ever had a rose apple? The closest thing you eat to one is this, this lychee nut that they put in your, in your uh, uh, what do you call it, your uh, chop suey in a good Chinese restaurant. But a rose apple is delicious. It's almost like a, oh, it's almost like a transparent skin. I would say they're about like that, about that size. And they, they taste like a rose. They grow in Florida, great big trees. <coughs> Who knows? That could have been the Garden of Eden back there. Just somewhere. All right. <clears throat> All the redeemed attributes. He was the spoken word. We who are redeemed are part of him. Then if you can recognize that, see? Now that's what he's pointing at. This is your entree. This is your key. This is your <clears throat> faith in this witness <clears throat> which has been vindicated. <clears throat> Now, every church age and every generation, every revival has looked for this hour mm -hmm. when they know this is it. But we know because of what we have become acquainted with. Then if you can recognize that, see, the Pharisees claimed they were, but you see my first illustration, <clears throat> they were only that intellectually. They couldn't recognize the word when it's made manifest. You see, they made their claims. 
but they made their claims intellectually. Mm -hmm. They couldn't recognize the word. Now, if that is really the truth, and that's the word, <clears throat> and we recognize it, what more do you want? Amen. Where do you want to go? Is that different from the apostles, from Peter, James, and John? Not one bit different. <clears throat> if Matthew 12 is a repeat, and we see it, that's all that's necessary. Yeah. You go from there. <clears throat> you go from there because you keep seeing, you keep believing. Israel, of course, knew that he was coming, but they didn't recognize him when they came. See, they couldn't recognize the word, Brother Brother Branham said, when it was made manifest right before them. They said, this man's an evil spirit. Now, today, we're called false prophets. Now, Brother Branham did not like that term. He was highly offended, and I don't blame him. Because a false prophet is a man with genuine signs and wonders and gets plumb off the word and leads people astray. Now, the beautiful thing I'd like to know is this. How many does Brother Branham lead astray? Well, let's say that the Baptist got 13 million. <laughs> well, really, those who really believe this message, you couldn't get 100,000 if you bled to death trying to get it. Yeah. You couldn't get 10,000. Right. Who's leading who straight? Are the Baptists right because they got 13 million? Are the Catholics right because they got 50? <clears throat> How many they got in America? Who knows? I don't know the figure. I know for the first time, Catholicism outbalances prophecy. Well, they've got the most, are they right? By no means. Anybody knows that the majority is always wrong, always has been wrong, always will be wrong. <clears throat> so that's the one I get away from. Yeah. Except they can't stand the minorities either. <laughs> now, I think I might take the majority and get lost amongst them and try to pick these small minorities up. I was just thinking the other day, it comes down to some, I'm with Brother Brandon. What I was thinking about just the other day, he said, <clears throat> he said, some of these independents are worse than the organized. And they are. They are. It's too bad. Well, they said the man's an evil spirit. Today we're called false prophets. We're called every dirty thing that could be called by religious people. See, by great and talented men. See, they just don't understand. <clears throat> the truly great principle of this hour that, that we stand on is going to be denied. And I feel sorry that more and more people will deny it. It's water baptism just wasn't sufficient to cleanse it either and neither is theirs. In other words, back in the flood, it wouldn't do it. <clears throat> it won't do it now. Sanctification by the blood bought it back and cleaned, but the baptism of the fire cleansed it, like he did his bride, like justification, sanctification, back to the Holy Ghost. He's right back again to the typing of the everything that's under redemption. And they don't go back to the baptism just like Judas did. He never did. He didn't get that far. <clears throat> he healed the sick and raised the dead, but he never got to Pentecost. He betrayed God. He betrayed God before the Holy Ghost could come. And you show me one organization that hasn't betrayed God before the Holy Ghost came. And there's a picture right there. People don't have to believe it. We believe it. Now, he ne never promised to raise up a new race. He repeats it. As I've said, but he promised to redeem the fallen race. Who were they? God's fallen sons. They that were the predestinated inherited as he has promised. Now, there again, you see only predestinated go in there. And he's the unchangeable God. We know that, so don't fool with it. <clears throat> Don't try to change it. See? Now remember, the flesh is not redeemed, but it's in process. You know why it's in process? Because the Lord descended the shout to raise it in. Mm -hmm. 299. Remember, God took Elijah after the rapture and transplanted him back among the people to take the place of the prophet among his people. As Matthew 17, we saw him up in the Mount Transfiguration. Pretty soon you'll do that. He's kept him alive 2,500 years, he'll appear again. Notice again, he raised up Moses from the dead. Where is his grave? Can anybody find it? Everybody knows nobody did find it. Read the book of Jude. The angel disputing with Satan said, The Lord rebuke you, disputing with the body of Moses. And here Peter, James, and John are standing there looking at him on transfiguration. So where, what's good to the grave? Grave, who knows where it has been? He's even got a grave. <coughs> he stood there on transfiguration. Right there in the land where the mountains to be raised up on, to dwell with, where we're dwelling in. See, he came to redeem it. <coughs> now why does Brother Branham put him there? I ask you a question. Did Jesus have a human body went up there? What happened? It was just transfigured. What kind of bodies do you think they had? Is it wrong to believe that they had regular human bodies that were transfigured? Not to my way of thinking. 
So I just don't know what God will do. You didn't know that John the Baptist would have the Holy Ghost before he came out of his mother's womb. Now think that one over. And you and I got to wait and struggle. He saw Jesus face to face. You and I got to wait. What gave him the right? God did. Want to argue with God? That's what this sermon is trying to show you. Predestination. Holy city, here I come. The more I hear it, the faster I run. I like my poetry. <coughs> Just make it work now. He's trying to tell you something. This is real. You're dealing with people. Factual people. One of which didn't die, one of which did die, and here they are. You see why I can believe that Melchizedek was a literal king with a, with a city and everything else right on earth there? God came down and made his own city temporary, had a rent new servants. Oh, God wouldn't do that. Did you ask him? Or did you advise him? He shouldn't do it. Now, you don't know that I'm right or wrong. I believe I'm right. I don't have a bit of trouble. The only trouble I got is getting there. In a hurry. In good shape. Feeling good. I don't know what your trouble is. I imagine it's like mine. <coughs> he came to demon. All right, 301. See, there was the raptured church then represented. Who, was, who represented us? Elijah. Mm -hmm. See? There are the ones who were asleep represented. <coughs> who was that? Moses. Whereabouts? Where were they? In the city. Up on top of the mountain. That's the first resurrection. See? Now, look at There was Peter, James, and John looking on three as a witness. Those three men saw. It. There was Elijah, Moses, and Jesus as a heavenly witness. In other words, <clears throat> that side had come down to this side. That side is on this side. That side is on this side. Hasn't gone away. <coughs> There's your witness. <clears throat> there was Moses, the dead been raised up. There was Elijah, represents a rapture, still alive. And they were representatives on the holy mountain. And Jesus, the Redeemer, with God above him, overshadowed him, said, This is my beloved son. So here, what do you see? You see a mountain. <clears throat> you see God's resurrected people. You see Jesus, the head of it. God above it speaking. What is that? New Jerusalem. <clears throat> In a perfect time. Already demonstrated on earth. So you know what it's about, where you're going. 302. Jesus said about a day before that, he said, Verily send you, the summer standing here, they'll not see death until they see the kingdom of God established in power. <clears throat> now the word isn't established in the Bible, it's a coming in power. But he's using this for our day. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was established back there as the truth because it was witnessed by men. This also is established by truth. <clears throat> so therefore, what was established to them was the coming kingdom. And what is established to us is the coming kingdom. Because it's verified. Now the point is how are you going to miss what's yours? Now if you, if your father died and a crooked lawyer took the estate, that's different. But when Jesus died, he rose again and said, I'm going to see them together. <laughs> <clears throat> you couldn't want anything better than that. What was it? The resurrected dead and the raptured saints were together, caught up together to meet him in the air with God overshadowing him, and Jesus standing there in the shadow, saying, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. In other words, just like the, the future kingdom, where Brother Branham says before the he before they call the answer. The order of the kingdom, of the new kingdom. So this is a perfect picture and type <clears throat> of the whole thing. Now, meaning this. That the truth that Brother Branham spoke of, using Matthew 17 as a type, has been vindicated in this hour by Matthew 12, wherein Alpha has become Omega. Got a pyramid of angels up there. <clears throat> everything, everything with it. It is the order of the kingdom. And that is perfectly true. It's been established. Ephesians 1, 17 to 23 is established. Hebrews 6, 
the witness on the earth has been established. <clears throat> there is nothing that has not been established. Oh, brother, sister, death doesn't change you. Death only changes your dwelling place. <clears throat> Illustrate. Remember Samuel when he was dead and been buried about two years. He was in paradise. The witch of Endor called him up. And Saul even recognized him. And she did too. And when she did, she fell on her face. Sure she did. He hadn't changed one bit. He was still the same Samuel after being dead two years. Still a prophet. Now remember, he came up with a white-haired old man. Now he ain't going to be dead. He's not that way now. He's already come to his part of the resurrection. <clears throat> he said, tomorrow as a prophet, you'll fall in battle, your son with you. By this time tomorrow night, you'll be with me. That's just what happened, see? And when Moses returns back on Elijah for Revelation 11, they'll still be prophets. Hallelujah. Now, Brother Branham <clears throat> was more of the faith that Elijah and Moses would themselves be the two prophets than simply the spirit of Moses and Elijah on two different men. But when categorically asked the question, he couldn't say. <clears throat> but you'll find that almost every place he leans this way. See? And that means, and let this sink in, that William Branham will return to this earth as a prophet. And if we're living, you will see him. Mm -hmm. What would he tell us? I don't know. But it'll be exactly right with this message and exactly right what we need to know for further advancement. Because look at here. The sanctification of the earth in 1,000 years is totally dependent upon the Word of God. And anything that you and I need is totally dependent upon the Word of God. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Remember, Jesus came back and told them things concerning the kingdom. And William Branham will do the same thing. Just what all he will do, I don't know. Some people think he'll do mighty and great works. That's fine by me. But I, I don't know what, I'll tell you one thing, if he does, it isn't going to do you and me any good, I don't believe, in this sense, that it's already too late. It might be a manifestation, something you could just, well, make resurrection faith, you call it that. I don't, I don't go against that. But I, I'm not a person to try to look at things that I, I don't feel I'm entitled to. But he will be back. If he doesn't come back, forget it. Because remember, he's dependent on that. <clears throat> Absolutely depending on it, see? Now, so there's a great moral here. How identified are we with the life of Christ. How dedicated are we? Because he said, death only changes our dwelling place. It doesn't change us. The more we have of Christ, the less we'll have of ourselves. The less we have of ourselves, not necessarily get more of Christ. You get more denomination, more this, more that. But if you have this word, you can get more and more of him if you get less and less yourself. 304, and over yonder in the land, in the city where the Lamb is the light, I'll know you, Brother McKinney, speaking to a man that lives in Lyman. And I'll know you, my people, my jewels, and my crown. When they come from the east and west of this city, when 1,500 miles square should be sitting there in the city built four square, when he's, when he's sitting there on the whole, in the holy mount, where God sits upon the mount and Jesus on the throne, and the golden trumpet sounds when Joseph leaves to walk down through the paradise, and the children of God fall upon their knees and worship him, knowing they are redeemed. Amen. It goes back to the time of Joseph. <clears throat> when the trumpet was blown, they all fell down and worshiped Joseph. Now, we're at page 66. I think there's a long way to go yet, in a way, but the, some of this is going to be read very, very rapidly. How many time you got in? Oh, well, we got about, that's about far enough for a year. <clears throat> there might be something I can pick up in question and answers uh, here. I'm not sure if that don't if that's question and answers or not. But I got some already written out here in question and answer for this. <clears throat> so, all right, we'll, we'll just leave this off here. <clears throat> and remember, the main thrust is the reality of which we are walking in the light, knowing that we have the full potential. And it's like the film taken by the expert photographer. Or maybe not so expert photographer. Doesn't matter. <clears throat> the picture has been taken. But we have an expert and we produce it from the negative to the positive. And he will see what you already see in 2 Corinthians. When you look in the Word of God in this age, you see Christ. You don't see yourself. You will see the perfections that God develops. And that's what you're looking at now if you're catching what I'm trying to talk about tonight. I was, that's where my inspiration was tonight. To help us to see, as never before, that we have the full potential 
of the reality. It's not anymore down the road. It's in our hand. Don't you realize what I'm saying? Abraham went out looking for that city. <clears throat> and you know something? He was treading right on. And God said, not now, but later. You know, it's good we sang that song that I can know. <clears throat> about standing there and looking across the sea. I'm going to tell you something, Brother Sister. I don't think we have to look very far anymore because the looking has been done. God's already done it for us. And my what an attitude would come into this church, our souls, our lives day by day, to get the stimulation of this revelation. Because don't you see, it's God's ultimate. Yeah. What God wanted all along. Lord, help us. Let's ride this. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for the time we're about to come together to study your word, Lord, to talk about it, to get engrossed in it, Lord. But Lord, we just have one little disappointment. We know it's not you, Lord, it's ourselves. Unless it's maybe not the hour. But we are very, very concerned, Lord, about our lack of, of stimulation or revelation uh, to be more like the prophets. Not we don't want to be prophets, God forbid. I would no more want to be William Branham, Lord, than nothing because that is ridiculous. But I want to be me with what this word has for me at this hour. And we're praying for everybody in this building tonight, dear Lord, especially. And many couldn't be here, Lord. We're praying for them, too. They're good, fine people. We're asking, Lord God, visit us, we pray, in the spirit of revelation, wherein you are now here, O oh God. We know you're visiting. But visit upon us, Lord, the stimulation of this revelation that Brother Branham had and gave to us. Because we know, Lord, it's very important and it's going to do something for us. Oh, God. So all these things like sensations, Lord, and everything else we've dealt with, you can see that it hasn't done. It's not going to do it, Lord. It's, it's going to take this to do it, the reality. And Father, here we are with the full potential waiting for the full manifestation. Help us, oh, God. Don't let my sister, my brother, me, my wife, my children, anybody, Lord, that names the name of Jesus Christ and has anything what's to do with the message even indirectly, Lord. To fail at this time, we pray. Lord, we know that there will not be a real failure. But we know that it's possible that some will lose a grasp on some of these things. And though they make it, it will be as though someone took their crown. Or someone got a reward that they're losing out on by not being fully in, in identification with it. So, Lord, here we are today, tonight. We just pray, Father, you'll help us, Lord. Just, I don't care if it changes right around. We're in a process of change anyway. And this will be for the better. So, Lord, may there be nothing that we're not willing in our souls, our hearts, our minds to just turn right over to you at this time. Knowing that, Lord, what we're looking at is the greatest thing in the world for us. And you planned it all. When you planned us. And there is no separation between you and us and the works of of your hands that are for us and for you. Under thee we give praise, O oh God. Help us, Lord. Help us, help us, help us in the name of Jesus Christ to enter into this, O oh God, in the joy of the revelation and the power of 